Anyway, man, we've been in a series talking about I don't know what I believe. Oh, did how we tell y'all that? Next week, you know, every year we do something fun. So next week is uh, wear your favorite college team shirt, okay? So if you don't love Jesus, it's okay. Wear those orange clothes. We'll pray for you. We'll <laughs> sanctify you. We'll cover you by the blood of the lamb and our Red Raider gear. It'll be good. Uh, so wear that here. That, the, the title, Burnt Orange, should let you know where it came from. <laughs> All right? Anyway, so we'll do that. And then the week after, we'll do your favorite uh, NFL team. And we'll do stuff like that. It'll be fun. But we're in a series about uh, spiritual warfare. And the Bible actually has a ton to say about it. And I think it's also a great way to follow up our conference that John Thomas did with us here. But Ephesians chapter 6 says it this way. Finally, be strong or take courage or you might read, be of good cheer. See, you see that a lot in the Bible because whether you know it or not, you are in a fight. And it says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. In other words, it says you need to get dressed for this battle regularly. It's happening. So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And what you need to know is the enemy right now has his whiteboard <laughs> and all of his little demons. And they're up there writing plan A, plan B, plan C, D, E, F, G. And they're trying to come up with ways to, to trip you up. And I think many times the devil works harder to destroy us than we're working at keeping him from doing it. You may catch that on the way home. And the word says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the power of a dark world, and against spiritual forces in the, of evil in the heavenly realms. Now that phrase, heavenly realms, is used at least four other times in the book of Ephesians. And so it's like the Bible's letting us know there's another realm other than the one you're experiencing right now. And, and, and I want you to know there is, and there's a, another realm going on. And, and if you'll be honest, you've sensed it. There, there are some things you can't explain. Some of the tragedy, sometimes you've got to live life long enough to know that there's a real enemy. You ever notice how when, when, when everything's going wrong in your life, it seems like that's when the enemy shows up the best? When you're trying to figure out how you're going to pay the light bill and if you're on LP&L, if you're trying to figure out <laughs> robbing somebody else's, like I would go plug an extension cord. My neighbor's, no, I'm just playing. Um, <laughs> you're trying to figure out how to get all this stuff done, man. And it seems like when you're the most stressed, when you're down the most, that the enemy loves to come and just keep his foot on top of your head. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Can I tell you that that doesn't, that's not by coincidence, it's if I can get you before you get traction, then I can keep you from ever finding out how good God really is. So there's another realm uh, going on that you cannot see, but it's happening right now. It'll get you thinking about other things other than the word of God. It'll get you dozing off here in a minute. I don't know how you're going to doze off on me. I'll wait. No, I'm just playing. It'll get you dozing off and stuff. Look at this. It says, therefore... Put on a full armor of God so that when, watch the words there, not if, so that when, it, it means it's coming, it's going to happen, the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. So that's the end goal today, or the end goal of the worship center, really, as you're on your journey, is to help equip you to still be standing at the end of the battle where you can say the lightning flashed and the thunder rolled, but I'm still here. He gave me his best punch, but I'm still here. I may be bruised, but I'm not dead. I wish I could get some help in here. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, it's a good time to wake up. What would it be like if we could give you tools and the weapons to fight back and instead of being a casualty you actually started winning the warfare in your home you actually started winning the warfare in your marriage and over your kid what would that be like and, and some of you are like well pastor todd i don't even want to talk about it you just talking about spiritual warfare freaks me out 
And if I don't think about it, it's not happening. It's happening. Yes. It's going on. It's, it's going, well, I'm afraid I don't want to talk about it. Listen, I wouldn't be being a good pastor if I didn't try to give you these tools and to try to tell you that it's going to happen and to come to tell you that God has already made you the head and not the tail, that you have already been made a conqueror. See, that's my job to put that in you. And there's actually a scripture that tells you that in Ephesians 5.11. It says, having nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. So that's my job as a pastor to let you know that the enemy is trying to destroy you with some stupid stuff, with some crazy stuff. And and, and some of it is things he hits us with, and some of it's the things we dabble in. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about exposing the devil for who he is. So if you're a note taker, here's number one. You're going to want these notes, I promise you. This is a message you're going to want for a long time to help you. Here's number one. The devil's real. Well, I don't want to hear that. (laughs) He's real. He's real. He's not a figment of your imagination. He's not a metaphor. He's not a a, a symbol of evil like some Christians believe. He's not a cosmic force. He's a fallen angel. The Bible actually names three different angels in Scripture. It talks about Gabriel, uh, Michael, and and, uh, Lucifer. And all three of them used to reside in heaven But an event takes place, and and nobody really knows when that event happens, but Satan gets cast out of heaven. Now, I believe this, and I I believe this before I read this, so I'm not as dumb as I look. I want want you to know that. Don't judge me by this book like, Pastor, I look dumb. I I, I know a little bit of stuff. You can put it in a thimble (laughs) and fill up a thimble with what I know. And so, but I believe this, and most scholars believe that when Satan got thrown out of heaven, it happened between Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. You say, well, what makes you think that? Because it says this in Genesis 1. There's a gap. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. You don't put a period unless something's finished. It's the end, right? Now, watch verse 2. The earth was without form and void. So something happens, in my opinion, between... The second, first and second verse, because surely God wouldn't have created something that was formless and had nothing to it. Where else in create, when you read about creation, do you see any of that character or the nature of God that he created anything fruitless and void? So something must have happened in there. And I believe that that's when the devil got thrown down to earth. And, and it's recorded in the Old Testament twice, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Uh, records the time when what basically what the devil does is he shows up and he said, look here, man. <laughs> See, I don't know why he says it like that, but he does. <laughs> look here, man. All this worship I'm doing for you, I ain't going to do it no more. I want all this worship for me. And God says, I don't think so. <laughs> Boom. And God throws him out of heaven. And, and Jesus said, It happened so fast in Luke chapter 10, verse 18. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning out of heaven. In other words, what Jesus just said in our language today, my dad kicked him out and it wasn't a struggle. It happened in a millisecond. It was, you know you got whooped when you got whooped in a millisecond. You can't even defend that. How are you going to try to be all manly? How long did it take? A millisecond, dog. There's two places in the Bible that blow my mind about beatings. One's when, he, when the devil got kicked out of heaven, millisecond. The other one is when they go out and they get beat up so bad that they get, the <laughs> Bible says they got beat naked. <laughs> you know you got whooped when you come back home with no clothes. <laughs> and I know you want to be tough and be telling everybody, you ought to see the other guy, fool, you naked. It don't matter what he looks like. You are naked, brother. And so that's going on. (laughs) See how my mind works? It was over. Now, here's another recording of it in Revelation chapter 12. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. I love this part right here. This gets me so excited. But he was not strong enough. Huh? And they lost their place in heaven. You see, the demons 
lost their place. But when he talks to the disciples, he said, don't rejoice that the demons know your name, but rejoice that your name has been written in heaven. In other words, I took them out, but I put you in. I wish somebody would go with me on this, man. He said, this is what you need to know. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, that scripture just said, the devil is not strong enough to take you out. He's not big enough to take you out. The great dragon, listen, the great dragon was hurled down. Watch out. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Now that's the part you need to know. Why, Todd? Because that's where the devil's operating right now. And, and, And that may be why the earth became void and formless and that's what he's trying to do in your life the enemy wants your your life to to mean nothing to have no uh creativity in it to have no life into it he wants you to be formless and void he's against you but but here's some good news he doesn't have the power to create so all he can do is manipulate truth that's good news man and so let me prove you a little bit more that the devil exists john chapter 12 jesus said he's the ruler of this world 2 Corinthians 4 says, the God of this age, little g, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. What that just said is deceived people don't know they're deceived. You ever try to talk to somebody about the truth and you're sitting there like, I can't understand how you're not seeing this. They can't see it because the enemy's at work. Or catch this. Ephesians chapter 2 says he's the prince of the power of the air. First uh, John 5 says the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Now, that's a lot of verses that talk about the dynamic that's going on right now. Here's number two. The devil's at war with you. Not only is he real, he's at war with you. And he is strategically stream, uh, uh, scheming and devising a way to destroy you. He's working on it right now while you're at church. The enemy is trying to figure out a way from you for, to keep this word from getting in your heart. Because he knows if you ever learn these scriptures and you ever get that, that he's no match for you anymore. And, and, and you may say, well, I don't believe that. That don't make it not true. I don't believe I'm fat. But every time I walk by mirror, I'm like, there it goes. That is not a good look. That is not a good look on me. But somebody should have told me. And Trish said, I did. <laughs> and you know what I told her? Because I knew warfare was going on. I said, get behind me, Satan. In the no. <laughs> it doesn't change the fact just because you don't believe in it doesn't mean it's not happening. And you will become a casualty if you don't realize that there's a war going on. And one of the best gifts I can give you is to make you aware of what's going on around you right now. I want you to notice that that there's not just a few verses about warfare in the Bible. There's actually quite a few. There's only 66 books. And so if, if there's that many scriptures about warfare, don't you think warfare is something we are to pay attention to? It's there. First Peter 5 says this, be self-control and alert. In other words, he's saying, church, you need to wake up. Your enemy, the, the, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. He, he hides to pounce looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. You need to realize he's laying in cover. The devil will never show up looking like the devil. He'll show up looking like bluebell ice cream. For a diabetic, come on, somebody know what I'm talking about. <laughs> He'll never show up looking like the devil. You would recognize him as the devil. He'll never show up. And it will never be. He'll never show up as like something you don't like or want either. It'll be all something like that. In fact, in the temptations of Jesus, the, the one recorded time where the devil opposes Jesus himself while he's on earth, it's, it's Matthew 4 and Luke 4, uh, same story, two different places. The Bible says, watch this, the devil left until an opportune time. In other words, what he was saying, if you go back and read the story, is you got me this time, but I'll be looking for another time. 
I'm going to come back around. And, 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 and you need to know that that's how he's operating. He's, he's not going to give up trying to destroy you just because you got saved. In fact, I don't know if anybody else, this, is, this might not encourage you to know Jesus, but can I tell you, I didn't really have a lot of problems until I met Jesus. No, I met Jesus, then life was like, hell was like, oh, we're going to work overtime. But you know why? Because the, but he knew, I believe with all my heart, he recognized the anointing and the call on my life. And he knew, if, man, if Todd ever gets free of drugs and alcohol, he might get to help some other people get set free in the name of Jesus. And look, now we have like over 800 people that come to our church. Come on, somebody. That doesn't just happen. That's not because of me. That's because God's so great. So what are you telling me? I'm telling you, if you're under attack, greater the attack, greater the anointing that's on your life. Some of you ought to thank God right now. You've been going through hell and you wonder what's going on. It's not because God's not for you. It's because of what God put on the inside of you. Quit crying about all of it and stand up and recognize if God be for me, who can be against me? Woo, I feel like preaching. I hope you feel like listening. I'm going to give me a white towel here in a minute. Third thing, the devil has some power. I get asked stuff like this all the time. Hey, well, how much power does he have? <laughs> like, I need to know before I leave my house, you know. And then I get asked this all the time. Can, can a Christian be demon-possessed? I'm going to answer that. I personally do not believe a Christian can be possessed by a demon. Why? Once the spirit lives inside of you, it cannot house the spirit of the devil and the spirit of God at the same time. Bitterness, bitter water and sweet water can't come out of the same well. Watch me. That's my opinion. But every Christian can be harassed. Every Christian can be oppressed and attacked by the enemy, and you can suffer greatly into his hands, and, and you have a lot more to do with that than you know. I'm going to show you a verse now. Now, this verse is not really talking about spiritual warfare. It's talking about anger, but there's an important detail that we need to catch here, and it's Ephesians 4.26. It says, in your anger, which everybody in here gets angry from time to time, everybody. If you don't think you can get angry, ask the person sitting next to you. They'd be like, oh, shoot. <laughs> he says, in your anger, do not sin. In other words, don't let it go too far. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And don't give the devil a foothold. Now, we all sin. But when you do, don't leave that sin unresolved. Don't, don't, because you, when you leave sin unresolved, According to that, what you've done is you've left the crack open for the enemy to sneak in. You've left the door open for the enemy to come in and out whenever he wants to. And I don't know about you, but this is how I feel about my house. If you're not going to help me pay the bills, you sure not going to show up and tell me how to run this joker. So he don't have the authority to come in and out of my house whenever he wants to. I'm like, if you're not paying down on the light bill, you got to go. And so you might roll by my house sometimes. I literally ask my wife, I'll have the front door kicking air. And I'm like, dude, you got to go. Because if I'm home, you can't stay. You got to take that authority. It's been given to you as a believer. Pay attention. It's, it's not when you sin. It's when you don't deal with your sin. In other words, you just ignore it. You don't repent. So you actually have a part in how successful the enemy is in harassing you. And can I tell you, if it's a sin that you've been forgiven for and you've been trying to walk out, the Bible says when you go back to it, that thing comes back on you seven times stronger than the first time. Think about that, man. Now that's the bad news. Can I give you some good news? The devil is subject to our God. There's point number four. The devil is subject to our God. He trembles at our God. He lost a fight in a millisecond. And any time you align yourself with God, you can become as victorious as God was over the enemy. You just got to line up with him. 1 John 4 says this, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. Now, you ain't so great, and I'm not so great. But the one on the inside of us is greater than anything. Come on, somebody. 
And what may surprise you about all of this is how much, like, I really believe in these two realms. Whether you believe it or not, I think there's a dynamic, a spiritual warfare dynamic that many Christians overlook. And it would probably surprise you how I deal with it, how my wife and I deal with it as our family, how we treat it as spiritual sometimes and not natural. Now, I'm not saying that we don't respond in the natural I want you to hear, if my body gets sick, I go to the doctor just like everybody else does. But I consider, is there a source of the enemy that's trying to come up against me? When things are going wrong, Trish and I are like, I think there's something more to this. Let's go on a fast. Let's pray. Let's see what the God shows us and, 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 and go from there. Now, we're very quick to get together and, and, and do that. Now, let me tell you, because I don't want anybody putting words in my mouth. What I'm not saying is I do not believe every time somebody sneezes, the demon came out. It sounds like it on some people. I don't believe there's a demon under, uh, under every rock. I don't like people on Facebook get on my nerves. Drama book. And they put stuff like on there. Oh, y'all need to be like 7.30 in the morning. Whoo, y'all need to pray for me. The devil's after me early today, y'all. I was on my way to work, and I ran out of gas. That ain't the devil. That's stupidity. (laughs) Oh, y'all need to pray for me. I backed out the driveway and went down the street, and don't you know the devil was there? And the next thing I know, I got a flat. (laughs) Or it could be the 5,000 roofers that have moved into Lubbock that got their nails everywhere. It can happen. I'm not saying roofers are going around, hey, I'm going to throw out nails and just watch it pop, 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 pop. (laughs) But it happens. Think about it. They're hauling trailers all the time. Something's going to fall. What in the devil? You give the devil too much credit sometimes. There are things in my life that I didn't even need the devil. I just did it myself. (laughs) Like he found out later and he's like, oh, I didn't know Todd was doing so good at destroying himself. Well, (laughs) I did not even need to send that little nymph over there. I got, he is covered. Huh? Todd is in some good. <laughs> I believe this. I believe what's happening in the United States of America right now is spiritual and not natural. I believe it with all my heart. So what do we do? We attack this thing in prayer and fasting. The Bible says we're in a fight, and you need to learn how to fight. Nothing worse when somebody goes to fight and you know they can't fight. I'm like, bro, I'm just going to leave this. You, you can tell everybody you whooped me. I'm going to feel bad about doing this. I, I had somebody this last week call me up here at the church, tell me that he was going. Or actually, they called my mom. How are you going to call my mom to tell you you're going to whoop me? <laughs> they called my mom, and my mom's like, you need to listen to this. <laughs> and I want, you, <laughs> I want you to know I gave them a piece of my mind. Don't you run down my son. Don't you talk about my son that way. I said, well, give it to me. I'm going to do more. (laughs) So I called old boy. I said, hey, man, I heard you want to throw it down. Well, you I said, look here. From 9 to 4 Monday through Thursday, I'm on 127th in Indiana. If you need some gas money, that's where I'll be. (laughs) You're not going to call me and tell you you're going to whoop me, and I'm just going to say, well, Lord bless you. Hallelujah. I just... I told him, I said, when you, if you come up here, it ain't going to be no Bible reading. It ain't going to be no praying. It's going to be some laying on the hands, and you're going to wish it never happened to you. Huh? Straight up. Why? Because my daddy taught me early not to. These haymakers right here, baby, AC and DC, let's do this. Y'all need to pray for me. I tell you all the time, anger's my struggle. Somebody's calling me, they're going to whoop me. I'm like, shoot, where you at, bro? I'll come to you. This fast food delivery. Anyway, so <laughs> it also, I wasn't this bold till Pastor Cameron started coming to church here. <laughs> Pastor Cameron, he's, he, woo, I, he called me yesterday and I called him back and I missed him. Then he called me again. I said, don't be screening my phone calls, man. I ain't scared of you. 
I watched all three Karate Kids. I'm an honorary member of Cobra Kai. <laughs> so, <laughs> pray for me. Anyway, 2 Corinthians 10 says this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. In other words, we don't use bombs and guns. The weapons we fight with, did you just catch this? Let me read it again. The weapons we fight with, in other words, it's written like it assumes you already know you're in a fight. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power. Watch this to de demolish strongholds. The stronghold in the Greek is the word akurama. It means any lie of the devil that keeps you trapped in slavery. Ooh. Any lie that is completely against the word of God, but just believing it makes it become a reality in your life. You have the power to cast that thing down. And it's the word demolish in the Greek comes from a katherio. It means to violently cast it down. Not just say you got to go. It's with authority. See, th there's nothing really passive about the word of God. And there's a part of Christianity that is not with a guitar sitting around a fire singing kumbaya. There's a part where there's confrontation with the devil and you need to know that. But don't let that freak you out. Don't be afraid. Fight your fight. Stand your ground. You can't treat this thing passively as it's not happening. You've been given weapons, and those weapons are well able to overcome anything he has. Which brings up the questions, well, what's some weapons? Because I need some. First one, the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Names have power. Cancer is a powerful name. Debt is a powerful name. Depression is a powerful name. But I got good news for you. Philippians 2 says, Our God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him a name that's above every other name. That's a good praise for a praise break right there. That's when you need an organ and a church. That's when you need an organ and a road. At black church, they call it getting your buck on. Who knows about that? Who is that way back there? I got you. you got to get your buck on sometimes, man. I love it. I love it with all my heart. And that's when we need to, mm, and some drums. And a, anyway, let me go back. Well, I get it on quick. Y'all don't even know me. I love to worship God. So. When we were growing up, my brother would come in. He's nine years younger than me. He tried to thug his way up in my room. You need to clean your room. I said, you're nine. You don't even matter. <laughs> I'm 18. Going down the hall. Then he come back in there and he said, dad just called. And dad said, you better have your room clean before he gets home. You know what I did? I jumped up and cleaned that thing because his name was a name above all names in that house. And what I'm trying to tell you is that's the same authority you have when the devil tries to show up. That's what you do as a believer. Philippians chapter 2 says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that's above every name, that at that name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, my God, and under earth, that every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Are you hearing what I'm telling you this morning? So when depression lifts its head and debt lifts its head or whatever it is, you just call on the name of Jesus. You say the name. You sing the name. We say disease, anxiety, addiction. I know you're powerful, but the Lord Jesus rebuke you. I call on the name of the Lord Jesus as the ruling name above all names. And every devil in hell has to line up under the name of Jesus. When you pray to the Father, you pray in Jesus' name. Now, I've been mentored by a couple guys. And I pray for every member of TWC. And as the Lord gives me memory, I call out your names. But every day, I pray for every member and a tender that attaches itself to the worship center. 
And here's the prayer I pray. You might think it's a little over the top, but I just want you to know not to build me up, but to let you know what's going on when you think nobody's praying for you. This is done for you every day. And I, and I read it every day because I don't want to miss a beat. Heavenly Father, I bow in praise and in worship before you. I surrender myself and this church completely and unreservedly in every area of our lives to you. We take a stand against the devil and we resist all the schemes and the plans of the devil and his wicked spirits to rob us of the will of God. So, whew, in the name of Jesus. I take authority over bitterness, unforgiveness, resentment, hate, jealousy, malice, envy, insecurity, fear, inferiority, rejection, self-pity, self-hate, murder, anger, rage, violence, sexual immorality, impurity, adultery, fornication, lust, pornography, pride, lying spirits, rebellion, deception, manipulation, control, judgmentalism, arrogance, racism, greed, materialism, selfishness, selfish ambition, covetousness, depression, anxiety, addiction, dependency on alcoholism, drugs, obesity, City, rebellion to authority, heresy, false doctrine, stealing, softness, laziness, unbelief, guilt, shame, embarrassment, humiliation, words, curses, spells, witchcraft, and the occult, blasphemy, sickness, disease, infirmities, and chronic health problems. I declare the name of Jesus is higher than any of those other names over every member of the worship center. Did you know that according to Romans 10, people always equate the scripture to salvation, but it doesn't just have to be salvation. Romans 10 says, everybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's good news right there. If that don't make you shout, your shadow's broke. <laughs> Second thing, the word of God is a weapon. This book is alive. This book has power. This book... Uh, <laughs> has authority. Well, Todd, that's your opinion. No, nope, not my opinion. Hebrews 4. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. All throughout the Bible, it talks about the word of God as a metaphorical weapon. Well, what's a sword? A sword is an offensive weapon. It's the only weapon listed in the armor of God. Let's go back to the scripture we started with this morning, Ephesians 6. Stand firm then. With a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted, watch the scripture because I think this gets tossed to the side, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In other words, you're willing to go wherever God calls you to go. You're willing to do whatever God calls you to do. In addition to all this, take the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You understand the devil's so much a punk, he don't even have the guts to face you face to face. I just read it. He sits over behind a bush. Pew. 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 Because he knows the word better than we do. And he knows he's already been whooped. So if he comes up and exposes himself, he knows that he's got to go. So he'll just nag you. Pew. Pew. But he says, <laughs> take the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit, which is the word of God. That's what Jesus did in Matthew 4, and that's what he did in Luke 4. All three occasions, Jesus responds to the devil with scripture. Nothing more than scripture. So your Bible isn't for just little nice warm fuzzies. It's a weapon. Treat it like one. Use it like one. Luke 10, 19 says this. Where, where it puts the word you, I'm going to drop my name in there. Is that okay? And I encourage you to drop your name in there. So it says, Todd, you have been given authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm Todd. 
You got to put that in there. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? You make it personal. You put yourself in there. That'll change the way you leave the house. You won't leave the house looking like something the dog drug in because the cat wouldn't have. You'll leave the house with air in your lungs and your head held high with his praises will be continually on your lips when you know who you are and nothing's coming against you. You got to make it personal. Use this thing as a weapon. Read it. Learn it. Quote it. Back at the devil. You can't go around and say, hey, well, my pastor said Sunday. What my pastor said on Sunday, what they said on TBN, TBN, TBN preacher, TBN preacher. (laughs) David said, thy word, O Lord, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. You can't go around fighting the devil with a book you don't know. You got to put it in yourself. You got to put it on yourself. Use it as a weapon. Third thing, the power of the cross, which is the ultimate defeat of the devil. This is a part of the cross that most Christians don't know or they don't understand or they don't use. Most Christians think the cross was just Jesus died on it to save me of my sins. And that's right. And that's the majority of it. But Ephesians said between the day he died on Friday and the day he was resurrected on Sunday, he went into the lowest parts of the earth. Why? What was he doing down there? He was confronting your enemy once and for all. Once and for all, he said, I took care of everything. He told the devil, he thugged himself up and he told the devil, give me them keys. And the devil couldn't do nothing. Jesus just snatched them. You ever got snatched? I mean, just, just snatched them. And you're there and you want to be bold and you want to do something, but you know you can't because you're powerless. And I'm sure when Jesus walked away, the devil's like, he better be glad I was having a good day. I wouldn't have let it so easy. Because he, he got impressed all the demons around him. But Jesus knew, when you got real authority, you don't have to raise your voice. <laughs> he just took them. And Jesus took the keys of eternity. Watch this. He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. The, the Bible called it. He ripped them out of his hand so that Jesus could be the one who could control your eternal destination. Not even death could conquer. Not even death could hold him. Are you seeing how powerful he is? And they all thought, well, he's not really Jesus. He's just an imposter. If he's just an imposter, if he's just an imposter, how come they wrote a rock in front of his tomb? If they didn't really think he was who he says he was, why go to all the trouble of putting a rock in front of the tomb? And if he's not who he says he is, why do you put guards outside of the tomb to guard the rock? Even a, even a rabbit will put its head on top of a lion. If a lion's dead, that rabbit just... <laughs> I'm telling you, they wouldn't say it out loud, but they, they recognized authority. But they couldn't say it out loud because it, it ruined their, their, their reputation. Jesus says in John 1 verse 8, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. You know you are a bad preacher when you amen yourself. Huh? You up. Look at Jesus, what he said. I am he who lives and was dead and behold, and I'm alive forevermore. Amen. 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 You ain't, y'all ain't going to do it, Jesus. Said, y'all ain't going to do it. Amen, Jesus. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to pick up one of his keys. Amen, Pastor Todd. And so I have the keys of Hades and death. So the cross didn't just pay for our sins. It conquered death. It conquered anything the devil throws at you. Jesus has already defeated. How do you use that one? Revelation 12. And they, that's us. And they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. What does that mean? I just say it. I just tell everybody that I'm saved. I'm healed. I'm delivered from the attacks of the enemy. And he says, and they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. That's my testimony. I'm, I'm, I'm saved. I'm healed. I'm redeemed. I'm blessed. And I go around telling that. And that takes the enemy's threat. When he tries to tell, yeah, you used to be a drug addict and, and you used to do this. And yeah, bro, you got a whole lot of used to in your throat. All I'm hearing is used to. You ain't messed up with did today. People, people like that get on my nerves. They will always, they're afraid for you to ever get over top. They want to hold you down because they're down. 
That's a lot of used to. You got to really be bitter to go around talking about what somebody used to do. Ain't you got nothing to do today? I'm going to leave that with you. Let me go home. Um, and you say, well, Todd, that sounds good. That sounds great. I'm glad it's working for you, but it ain't working for me. I'm glad giving your testimonies work, but Pastor, I've been struggling. Well, that's why he gives us Romans chapter 8. And I'm going to paraphrase verse 35. But it says, verse 35 is kind of talking, and, and he's going through some struggle. And he goes, I guess God didn't love us because we got all this calamity and we got all this trouble. And I guess God doesn't love me anymore. And I, I'm in dire straits. I'm facing death. Does anybody see what's going on in my life? Does anybody recognize I'm struggling here? He did. And so he wrote the next verse and he said, in all these things. Not some. Come on, church. Somebody say all. all. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Come on. That's a good place to give God a good shout of praise. He's already won the victory. He's already, the enemy has already been defeated. You just got to take that authority. But you, you, you can't walk out authority if you don't have the relationship to go out in his name. You hear what I'm telling you? You got to have, have the relationship with that name in order to go out and do these things. Because people will call you on it quick. Who are you? Who are you? Well, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I came all the way from the west side of Lubbock this morning to let you know that there's a word to proclaim over your life that the devil has not won and God has not done with you yet. I am telling you that this morning. Well, Todd, whose name do you come in? In my father's? In the name of Jesus? You don't have to be defeated. You don't have to be broke, busted, and disgusted anymore. You don't have to walk around thinking, man, is it ever going to get any better? Maybe, maybe the consequences don't change, but how you go through it does. Right. Like yesterday, there was nothing I could do about the rain. It's going to rain whether I want it to rain or not, and thank God for it. It's going to rain whether I want it to or not. So I could get mad about the rain. I can't believe it's raining. <laughs> or I get an umbrella. And then go singing in the rain. Huh? Put on some rubber boots. Now it ain't so bad. Yes, I went to uh, Lucas Amato. I went to his uh, uh, football scrimmage, sat in the rain, in my poncho. I didn't get wet at all. I'm looking at all these people getting wet. Like, Ooh, it's cold out here. I'm like, did you not know it was raining when you left your house? Because like, it didn't just show up right now. I'm a Royal Ranger. I had a poncho in my door. I was ready to go. <laughs> didn't get wet. Didn't get cold. Just. <laughs> what are you telling me? I'm telling you, you're going to go through some rain. But your attitude don't got to get drowned. <laughs> attitude affects altitude. You can't think any higher than you believe. And so you got to decide that Jesus is who he really says he is. And you've got to decide what he says about you is also true. Not only is he who he says he is, what he says about you is true. You know what he says about you? You're righteous. You're holy. You're redeemed. You're healed. You're whole. You're more than a conqueror. You're the head and not the tail. You've been built to win and not lose. You hear what I'm telling you? But you can only receive what you choose to believe. I can preach it and I can preach it because some people, whether we like it or not, I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to offend you. Some people love being a victim. They just love being a victim. They love to tell the story over and over again. They love to get, oh, sister, I'm so sorry. Brother, I'm so sorry. Like, I ain't sorry, bro. You've been telling the same story for 20 years. I ain't sorry no more. Because now you're choosing to stay stuck. I'm sorry you won't believe what I'm preaching. I'm sorry you're not picking up what I'm throwing down. 
That's what I'm sorry for. I'm sorry that the devil has you so deceived that you can't receive. Deceived people don't know they're deceived. We read a scripture about it a while ago. They can't see it. My job is to just keep praying and keep sowing seed. That's your job this morning. And I hope I sowed enough seed in you that you don't leave this place like the way you came. That you leave better and that you leave empowered by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of your testimony. I want every head bowed this morning. You're not here by accident. You're here by a divine appointment, whether you know it or not. Maybe you're here and and maybe you've been in a warfare and you've just been getting it handed to you. or, Or maybe you've never tasted and see that the Lord was good. But today's the day. I'll tell you this with heads bent. I start asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what's my takeaway today? What do you want me to leave here knowing? What am I supposed to walk out of here? What, what's the takeaway? Why are you doing that? I want to tell you this. I've been saved for 27 years now. But 27 years ago, I cannot tell you how many times I've invited the Lord into my life and asked me to forgive me my sin only to go right back into the sin that I was always in. It it must have been 50,000 times or 100,000 times I prayed that prayer. And with that, I think I'm being small-minded. I think it was way more than that. And I tell you that because the reason I was that way is because I was letting my preacher tell me how good Jesus was. And I never found out for myself. I was letting my mom and dad tell me who Jesus was. And I never found out for myself. But 27 years ago in Pampa, Texas, when I got really a taste of Jesus, I've had some struggles and I've had some stumbles. But I've never went back to anything that had me before. And the whole reason is... It's because I had a view of who he was. And once you have your own view, it can, nothing compares to your own personal view. They can tell you about it. The travel agent can tell you how beautiful it is. But till you get there, you will never know. So I'm inviting you to a personal view of Jesus this morning.